Sunday, baptism Sunday. So Jesus has given his church two practices called sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, to visibly and tangibly display the gospel. When we celebrate these things in true faith, connected to our Savior, they nourish our faith. And uh, I'm getting distracted because it's really cold. <laughs> They nourish and grow our faith when we participate these as the body of Christ. There are three participants in baptism. The people who are coming forth as candidates to be baptized, us as a church body, and God himself. When candidates come forth to be baptized, they are making a public profession of their faith, saying that they are all in with Jesus, that they have trusted him for salvation and are believing in him. We as a church, we hear these uh, professions of faith and we validate them uh, to belong to uh, the Church of Jesus Christ here at LBC. And ultimately, baptisms are a display of God's work in the gospel where he promises us that our old life is gone and we, have, we are raised to new life in Christ um, through faith in the Lord Jesus. So this morning is a great privilege for myself. I get to baptize first uh, Layla, one of my youth students. So come on, join me in the suffering here. <laughs> oh, 
We're in this together. No. <laughs> All right. So this is Layla's story. She said, I grew up with divorced parents and did a lot of moving around. My dad was in the military and my mom had to stay home with my brother due to medical issues. I was put into daycare on the base and had some friends where my grandmother and aunt would visit occasionally. I had to say goodbye, which was hardest of all, because shortly after we moved to New Jersey and I started school, my parents ended up getting a divorce due to the poor decisions that my dad made. A while later, my mom met my stepfather and she decided that she wanted to go to Puerto Rico to live with my grandmother for a bit. I got put into private school and got held back due to the fact that I didn't know Spanish. Everything was good until one day my mom had to leave for New Jersey with my younger brother. It was due to the fact that she was pregnant and high risk, but at the time I didn't know this, and so I had to stay behind since she had already paid for me to be in school. That was the worst moment of my life. My grandmother made a promise to me that once I finished school we would move back to New Jersey. After a lot of sad phone calls, tears, and I miss yous, it was time for me to come home. The day before we left, I found out the reason why my mom had to leave was because my baby sister needed medical care. I was very excited but confused at the same time. And it took me a while to get used to seeing my mom in person again, as, uh, in person again as well as everyone else. I started school a while after and got howled back again also due to the fact that this time I only knew Spanish. Being away from my mom made me grow and have separate separation anxiety from her and the rest of the family as well. She was always working hard to provide for me and my siblings, and no matter what sort of obstacle she was facing, she never let her break her down. My grandmother would help her out by taking care of me and my siblings, and I am forever grateful for it. That's when in second grade, God sent me a really good friend. And shortly after, I had a little friend group going, and we were friends throughout most of elementary and middle school. My mom and I also grew a really close bond together through that time. But the summer after middle school, I had to make a very hard decision to separate myself from my friend group that I was in and distance myself from my best friend. It was not easy since we had been so close for the longest time and I was scared of being alone. But sometimes being alone is better than being with friends with someone that is not on the same path as you, especially when that path includes God. God has helped me throughout this whole story and shown me what it's really like to have faith and believe. He has shown me that while everything may not make sense at the moment, if we trust him, it will all fall into place as we can begin to trust his care. We just have to be patient and not give up during any obstacle that may come along. I would like to thank my Madre and Zidi Kelly for being my inspiration for wanting me to get baptized today. I would also like to say thank you to my Grammy for always being there for me and helping me throughout school because I, was, I wouldn't be where I am today without you. I wish you could be here today, but I know that you are watching this online. Just know that I love you so much and can't wait for you to come home. And I am grateful that God has chosen me to be your daughter, niece, sister, and granddaughter. I'm thankful for Madre, Zidi, Kelly, and Grammy for being my three main supporters as well as Heather and Pastor Chris, who are like a second family to me. And I thank God for never giving up on me, showing me his love and mercy, and for helping me see who I am as a person. I can't wait to find out what he has in store for my family and for me. So Layla, I have one question for you this morning. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Based on your profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. No one said following Jesus would be easy, right? Wow. Well, I have the privilege uh, to baptize two incredible young men uh, this morning, and I've had the privilege of being part of their story. So it's amazing to be able to be in the pool with them today to share 
uh, in this uh, step of obedience as they identify with Christ. Christians have been doing this for 2,000 years, and you guys are continuing the process. So the first one coming forward this morning is Jay Morris. I've gotten to know Jay over the course of this year through our time at Brookdale, uh, and this is his story. Before coming to Christ, I was an atheist. Part of being an atheist is a lack of moral code and purpose. I had no moral guidance, no aim in life, and no motivation for self-improvement or the improvement of others. I went with the flow and was incredibly antisocial and had a general pessimistic outlook on people and on life. God changed my life by showing me the wonder of the world he designed. I saw that life did matter and that I had someone who had a plan for my life. I found peace that I had never felt before. A void in my heart had been filled. In Christ, I found courage, joy, and purpose. Today, God continues to guide me in all my actions. He's brought me to Brookdale, where I met Pastor Dan, who invited me to this church. Here I found something I had been missing for most of my life, a community of good, godly people who opened their arms to a total stranger and made him feel like family. I'm no longer isolated in my faith. I thank God for that every day. I pray that one day God will use me to help someone in the way that God used Dan to help me. Well, Jay, I know that you've been excited for this for a long time. I have. This has been something that's been an important part of your journey and glad to be here in the pool with you this morning. So one question for you. Have you professed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? That I have. Well, based on your profession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism. <laughs> Raised from the new of life. All right, come on down, Mikey. Man, it's cold. Yes, it's it's colder than you would think. Mikey, I know you also have been looking forward to this for a long time as you take the step of obedience today, and this is Mikey's story. My life before coming to Christ felt empty. I was a confused individual looking for my identity in the world. I grew up knowing God, but never forming a relationship with him. I started my faith journey as a Catholic, but came to a stop when my family decided to stop attending church. I knew the basics of prayer and looking to God for my help only when I wanted him, never only when I wanted him, but never meeting him. I knew there could have been more to grow, but I never found the right opportunity until God brought an acquaintance named Isaiah Drake into my life. God brought Isaiah into my life in high school, and he was one of the worst people to be around. (laughs) I found him to talk very highly about himself and would make sarcastic comments toward others. I tried my best to avoid him and stay away as far as possible. He switched high schools, which was a relief, and I didn't see him until my second year at Brookdale Community College. I originally saw him at a club fair event that was being hosted by Brookdale, and I immediately left the room and went to the cafeteria to eat a dry turkey sandwich. (laughs) It also seemed God had a plan to direct Isaiah to the cafeteria and to have a conversation with me. I found Isaiah standing right in front of me as he initiated a conversation to which I put up a mental walls in case uh, a sly comment was mentioned. Instead, Isaiah shared with me the gospel, and my walls suddenly collapsed. I knew from the way he was speaking with conviction that there was a sudden change of heart. He held an identity that was so abstract but felt so true. I desired what he had. I knew the way I was living my life was never going to have a purpose, so instead God showed me that anyone can change, and it is through him that began a good work in me and will continue to carry it on until the day that I go to Jesus or he comes to me. God used different ministries to enhance my knowledge about him and had an amazing two-week discipleship trip called Higher Trek that helped me to go all in on my faith. God did not justify me because of what I did, but what Christ does through me. It has since been a life-changing perspective on how to live life, to live as Christ, to die as gain. God has provided the necessary tools for me to grow in Christ. He has provided me with the mission house for the last two years with guys who are also looking to grow in their faith. I have great mentors who consistently talk to me when I feel at odds with the world. He's also blessed me with a job as a personal trainer to help people with their health and for some spiritual arms. 
More importantly, I've learned about the journey of sanctification. Romans 6.33 says, But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The fruit that you get leads to sanctification, and its end is eternal life. I now understand my journey will have its highs and lows, but the outcome of all of this will be in God's favor. I now ask those who are close to me to continue to keep me accountable in the faith, always reminding me that this day I have made a commitment to the faith that I can press on toward the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. To those who are new to this idea of following Christ, I ask that you deeply consider what this means for your own life. Consider how life would be different if you sought out God today. Lastly, I'd like to thank Pastor Dan for baptizing me, and please don't hold me down for too long because I don't want to meet Jesus today. <laughs> Thank you for being my pastor dad, too, by the way. <laughs> well, Mikey, I'm glad to be in this with you. And uh, just one question this morning. Have you professed faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes, I have. Well, based on your profession of faith and your desire to live for Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in baptism. <clears throat> Raised the newness of life. Woo! Oh, <laughs> Let's pray for these disciples. Father God, what a privilege to remember your good work in the gospel. That there's nothing that we can do to earn or merit our salvation. No amount of good that we could perform, no amount of church attendance or religious rituals we could observe that would earn our keep with you. But Father, we thank you for Jesus. That you've sent him to live the life we couldn't live. To die as a substitute for our sin on the cross. And to be raised victorious over sin, death, and Satan so that all who would put their trust in him could walk in newness of life. We thank you for these uh, brothers and sisters who've gotten baptized this morning and the reminder that it serves to all of us who have been baptized into the name of Jesus. Would you continue to strengthen our faith that we might walk in obedience and faith in Christ. We pray this all now in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand with us as we continue to worship through song.
please be seated. I think I have my feeling back in my feet, so that's good. I'm also thankful. We used to have a massive pulpit here, uh, which I just never felt comfortable speaking at because it was really built for guys who are like 6'3", and now we have an Italian pulpit, so I'm very thankful for this. Fits me better. Um, but my name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here. We're very glad that you're with us uh, this morning. Uh, we've been going through a series uh, through Philippians chapter 1 called All In, and we've been talking through some of our foundational commitments as a church, uh, why we exist, what our purpose is, what our mission is, what our, who we are, what our core identities are, and today we're going to talk about uh, where God has been leading us uh, as a church this year, our, our vision and our direction. Um, so our text this morning is from uh, Philippians chapter 1, uh, verses 27 through 30. And it's printed on the inside cover of your bulletin, the paper you received when you walked in. This is the word of the Lord. Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come or see you or remain absent, I will hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. In no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and this too is from God. For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning and we ask for your grace and mercy to be shed in our lives. We ask that you would just work in our own hearts a gratefulness for every good and perfect gift you'd showered on us. Lord, you have given us great gifts of having a home, having a car, having friends and relationships. These are things that we can often take for granted, refuse to see uh, the goodness of what we have as we pine for what we don't have. And so, Lord, may we just gratefully receive all things uh, from your hand. And, Lord, some of those all things is the difficult times as well, the suffering. And, Lord, we grieve and we, we uh, lament this morning with our brothers and sisters in Nashville who have been subjects of great violence and horror. We pray that you would be the God of all comfort to them. We know that the same spirit that dwells in us dwells in them as well. We pray that they would be a beacon of light, of your goodness, and of your gospel, Lord, which reconciles wayward sinners back to you. Lord, I pray that you would uh, please guide and direct my words that I would not say anything you would not want me to say this morning and be able to show Christ clearly uh, from this text. May we have open ears to hear what you have to say. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple years ago, uh, my wife and I, uh, we, were, we ran one of these uh, obstacle course races that kind of goes up and down a mountain. And as we were walking up the mountain, yes, just walking, uh, it was imperative to stay on the predetermined course that they had marked out with the tape uh, throughout, you know, the woods and everything, because you were liable, if you ended up wandering beyond that, to tumble off the side of a cliff. And staying within those guidelines was just incredibly important for our own safety and the safety of all the other participants in this race as well. And that's just a good principle and guideline, I think, for our lives as well, and that understanding God has given us certain guidelines, certain things about how to live, that staying within those things is a path of, of goodness and life 
and freedom. And yet one of the perennial temptations that we have is to wander off the path. That there's so many things like addictions or besetting sins or distractions that can call us off of this path from following where God would have us to be. But wandering off the path is not only one of the challenges of being on the path. See, the predominant, one of the predominant metaphors for having a relationship with God is going on a walk with God or walking with God. And this metaphor in the Bible, it implies that this journey is going somewhere, that there's a destination, that there's purpose, and we are to make progress on it. But as you know, walking is not a fast activity. It's slow and steady progress. It's merely taking the next step on the journey. And so one of the temptations that we can have as we're on this journey with God is to sprint. To sprint ahead of God. But the Bible never tells us to sprint for Jesus or do somersaults for Jesus or do these great incredible things for Jesus. It says to walk with him. But sometimes we run ahead of God, meaning we make hasty decisions. We have these predetermined ideas or desires that are in our mind of things that we want to do. And oftentimes what happens is we make that decision and then we backdate the justification for it, don't we? Right? We're really just ended up doing what we want to do anyways, but we try to give it some vaguely spiritual justification or reasoning to it. But really, really, we're just running ahead of where God is. But also on a walk, you can lag behind. When I played football and we didn't want to do conditioning, we did the hog jog, which is your, walk, your feet are walking, but you're like moving your shoulders and your arms, making it look like you're going faster than you really are, or at least trying, but it never deceived the coaches, actually. But we can lag behind God because there may be things in our life that we're holding on to that, he's, that are just dragging us down or holding us back. And God is saying, let go of that. Right? There may be a secret sin. There may be an addiction. There may be a toxic relationship. There might be some kind of habit that we have that's just weighing us down, but we don't want to let it go. There might be a dream that we're holding on to so tightly that God is saying, hey, come follow me. I'm going this direction, and we're five blocks behind saying, but I want this dream. And for some of you in here, as hard as it might be to swallow, God might be asking for you to uh, let go of that dream, for, to let that dream die. Now, that's hard, but the core essence of our faith, of Christianity, is that through death comes resurrection. And so there might be things that you're lagging behind God, following God. He wants you to give those up, but it's for a better future for you. Because he wants to, you to pick something up that he's calling you into that's a better way to keep in step with him and walk with him. So the rally cry that we've had for this year as a church is that we want to walk worthy. Essentially, if we could boil it down to two things, walking worthy means A, we just want to take the next step in following Jesus. What we really like about that question is, what's your next step to follow Jesus? Is that it applies to each of us in a unique way. My story is not your story. My gifting is not your gifting. My ministries are not your ministries. We all are unique and are in a different place. But what's your next step to follow Jesus? But it also means just being faithful. Just being faithful. That we're not trying to do extraordinary things without God's power on our own. Conceiving of some kind of awesome future for ourselves. We just want to walk. Be faithful. So what is faithfulness to Jesus, right? When we say we want to walk worthy, we want to be faithful to Jesus, what does that actually look like? And our text tells us that today. He really boils it down to three things, right? He says here in verse 27, conduct yourselves in a manner or walk worthy in a manner of the gospel of Jesus. Be faithful. Be faithful to Jesus. So that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. So faithfulness to Jesus looks, number one, it looks like unity and teamwork. What he's saying here. 
He said, I, I want to hear you standing firm in one spirit with one mind, one heart. I want the church to be one, to be united, to be together, striving for the faith of the gospel, working together, having teamwork. He wants a unified church that is one. So being faithful means pursuing the unity of the church. Now, this doesn't mean uniformity as if we're all clones of the leadership here, that we all look the same or talk the same or believe exactly the same things on on all the minute details of life. That's not what it's talking about. Unity is being united in Christ around the gospel. But unity has fallen on hard times these days because we live in deeply polarized times, right? Everyone has their tribe, they have their team, we get on those teams and we hate everybody else. And we don't make any concessions to the other side because if we happen to make a concession or believe, hey, you know, they may actually have like a point, we're betraying the tribe and the team and we can't give concede any ground because we'll lose, And calls to unity and loving each other. It sounds a little like, yeah, look at the old hippie on stage, right? Like, we need to fight. We need to stand firm. And he is calling to stand firm. But what are they standing firm in? One spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Unity is not an optional nice thing for our faith. It is essential. Theologians in the throughout church history for 2,000 years, they've kind of boiled down to what is a true church? And there's four characteristics. There's one holy Catholic apostolic church. It's apostolic, we meaning we believe the words of the apostles. It's Catholic, little c, not Roman Catholic, little c, meaning universal. It's global. It's holy, meaning we strive for holiness because we are found in Christ. And it's one. It's one. There's not many churches. There is one church, one people of God that manifests itself in many local churches like LBC, but ultimately there's only one church. Jesus himself prayed for the unity of the church. This is not optional. It is essential. Jesus, in his prayer, his, one of his, his great prayers called the High Priestly Prayer in John chapter 17, says this, Holy Father, keep them, meaning his disciples, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you have given me, that they may be one just as we are one. Jesus is praying for our unity, and we see the mystery of the Trinity in this verse that Jesus is praying, God the Son is praying to his Father, and so we see in the Trinity the pattern of bringing unity out of diversity. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three persons, but there's one God. There's unity in that diversity, and there's unity in the diversity of the body of Christ. We're all different. That's a given, and yet we can be one. We're one because when you trust in Jesus, you get united to Jesus just like every other Christian. We are one. And so faithfulness to Jesus looks like pursuing the unity of the church, And what I've found over the years is as much as we want to think that there's like these great cosmic battles for the gospel, and there are sometimes in the church where there's wolves and false teachers who try to lure us away from the gospel and lure you away from the gospel, that does happen. We've seen that and had to fend that off. And yet, oftentimes there's two things that tear at the unity of the gospel that I see much more frequently, which is relational hurt and disagreement over strategy. Relational hurt and disagreement over strategy. Look, we're all imperfect people in this church, even your leaders, and we, I've hurt people. I've said things that I shouldn't have said. I've done things that I shouldn't have done to some of you, and that can create alienation and rifts in the body. That's why we need to be quick to forgive. This is what Jesus talks about in Matthew chapter 5. He says this in how we are to live together as the people of God. He says, Therefore, if you are presenting an offering at the altar, but remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering 
before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your offering. Make friends quickly with your opponent at law while you are with him on the way, so that your opponent may not hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer and thrown into prison. What Jesus is saying there is, be quick to admit your fault. Be quick to reconcile with those that you've wronged. What Jesus is saying is that reconciliation actually should be happening first before worship. He's like, look, he's, he's talking to Jewish people at that time, so that's why it's flavored this way. But he's like, look, you're going to go offer a sacrifice before you do that religious ritual. Before you, I guess in our context, we could say, before you partake in communion, if you realize you've wronged someone, go make it right. Go reconcile with them. Don't worship but reconcile and then come back and, and worship because our love for God and our love for people, they're intimately connected to one another. You can't love God without loving others and loving others won't really happen unless you love God. And so the unity of the church is often, we, we tear against that with relational disagreement and, and hurt and we should be working to be quick to admit our mistakes, quick to ask for forgiveness and quick to grant forgiveness. But also I see that the unity of body, that the unity of the body is often, uh, we, we tear against that because of disagreement over strategy. We may all agree that we need to be making disciples, but the question is how? What's the best way? It's like um, we would see this come out and things really wouldn't work in the national championship game for uh, the NCAA, right? They just had the final four. The championship game is tomorrow. Both teams in it want to win. That's the goal. But there would be absolute chaos on the court if half the team was like, you know what, we just need to dump the ball into the post to the tallest guy and get close shots. And then the other half of the team is like, no, but really the best way to win is to jack up three-point shots. Right? There would be absolute chaos because there's no, there's no unity on strategy. And that's often what I've seen in churches, that it comes down to, look, we all want to reach, the God, uh, reach our communities for Jesus. We want to make disciples. And so we need to just be careful that we're not imposing our preferences, right, uh, in terms of the body and that we're accepting of the strategies. And we work these things out together to preserve the unity because we want to strive together for what's most important. And he says the faith of the gospel. The faith of the gospel. So unity and teamwork is what it means to be faithful to Jesus. Number two, we see courage and boldness is a way of being faithful. He says in verse 28, In no way be alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction for them, but of salvation for you, and that too from God. So what... Paul is saying here is, well, in the time of the early church, they had a lot of people who did not like them. They were kind of squeezed between two vastly different cultures, and, and nobody liked the early Christians. There was Jewish culture, and they didn't really care for Christians because they were saying Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Savior of Israel, and uh, they didn't they rejected Jesus. They put him to death. And so they were persecuting the early Christians because they didn't like that message that we are only saved by faith in Jesus. But the early Christians were also squeezed by the Roman Empire, the Roman culture, because it was a polytheistic, multiple gods kind of culture. And the linchpin of their religion was worship of Caesar, of the emperor, of the state. And the Christians would say, we have no king but Jesus. Jesus is king, Caesar is not. And so they were not looked fondly upon by the Roman Empire at times throughout history either. And thankfully, thankfully, in our country, we typically have not had a history of persecution, and yet suffering still happens, right? We've seen that on display very clearly with our brothers and sisters in Nashville on the hands of persecution of Christians. And there are opponents. We get opposed for our faith. It might be at work, it might be at school. 
And we need to just acknowledge that reality. In high school, people are going to make fun of you for holding fast to your faith. You got to get over it. It happened to me. It happened to Dan. It happens to everyone who tries to follow the Lord because you're going to end up going a divergent path than many of your friends. And it happens. You have to be okay with that. And you have to be okay also with not everyone liking you. It's just inevitable because we stand for things and the truth of God which aren't always palatable to the world at large. There is one God and one way of salvation in his son Jesus. But our courage is a sign of God's faithfulness. He says it's a sign of both God's sal uh, of salvation and judgment. This should give you great heart, Christian, because it says, don't be alarmed by your opponents. When you keep your head up and you keep going to your job or you keep going to your school or you keep facing that person that really doesn't like you very much because of what you stand for, it says that's a sign to them. It's a sign of God's coming judgment, but it's a sign of your salvation that comes from God too. So take heart. If you're being opposed, don't back down. Don't shrink away, but keep doing what you're doing. I think one of the greatest inspirations I've heard about this recently is the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3. I heard that on the, um, the youth retreat that I was at a couple of weeks ago. And I, I kind of forgot about that story, but it was very inspiring because I think it gives us the pattern for how we are to face opposition. In Daniel chapter 3, you have the Israelites, and they are in exile in Babylon. And the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, has an ego trip and he wants to create a, a huge golden statue of himself. So he makes this golden statue that's huge and he gets a whole choir together, a whole uh, a band together of everything that will play music. And when they play the music, everybody in the kingdom is to bow down and worship him, worship this golden statue of himself. But there's these three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and, Ab and Abednego, that will not bow. They will not worship this idol because they will only worship the one true living God. And so Nebuchadnezzar brings them to himself and says, hey guys, like you're not worshiping me. If you don't, I'm going to throw you in this blazing furnace. And so this is what they say, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego reply to the king in Daniel 3. They say, O Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. This is the pattern, I think. We could call this maybe the Abendigo option for the church, where you hold fast to what you hold fast to. If someone disagrees with that and they bring you, you say, I'm not going to worship anyone else but Jesus. Then you do nothing. Then they tie you together in ropes, and then they throw you in the furnace. That's the Abendigo option. That's what we do as believers, right? We say, no, I'm not going to worship, and we hold fast. And then we let the chips fall where they may. Because God can deliver, can he not? He may, he may not. That doesn't mean that he's not real. That doesn't mean that he doesn't have the power to save. We just give things over to his hands. So much in our fleshly nature, we have this desire to want to hit back, to fight back, to take vengeance. But we don't need to, because God is on our side. So we do the Abendigo option. We get tied up, we get thrown in the furnace, but then we see that when they're put in the furnace, then Nebuchadnezzar has a realization. He stood up and he said to his high officials, was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? And they replied to the king, certainly, O king. And he said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm, and the appearance of the fourth is that like a son of the gods. 
Nebuchadnezzar really didn't know what he was seeing, but he saw Jesus in the furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And in our trials, in our opposition, Jesus is there with us. He may deliver, but he may deliver through life or for death. We don't know. That's in his hands, but that's how we approach things. We stand firm, we worship, and we let the chips fall where they may. We see also, though, we walk worthy, right, by unity and teamwork, by courage and boldness. And we see in verse 29 and 30 that we uh, walk faithfully to Jesus with suffering and perseverance. He's describing uh, the Philippians, these Christians, and what's happened to them. And he says, For to you it has been granted for Christ's sake not only to believe in him, but to suffer for his sake. So what we see here, first of all, is that faith is a gift. God gives the gift of faith to us so we can believe. He says, it has been granted or given to you. Faith is not about just trying to conjure up enough willpower in our own heart to make it so. But it's God coming to us and working in our heart first. It's his gracious initiative to give us the gift of faith. But then the end of this verse, it it's hard and it's difficult and it should shake you up a bit because he says, look, you have been given the gift of faith to believe, but you have also been what? Given the gift of suffering. He said it has been given for Christ's sake, not only to believe, but also to suffer for his sake. And this is where I think that Christianity is different from any other viewpoint is that it sees, it can see, and it has good justification to see that suffering can actually be a gift. Because the paradigm of this is the crucifixion and death of Jesus himself. See, not everything that happens in our life is good, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that the tragedy and the, and, the, and, the, and the difficult times and the acute periods of suffering, that in themselves they are good things because we live in a broken world that's filled with sin, that's filled with the devil and those that would inflict evil. So there are things that are not good. Was the crucifixion of Jesus, an innocent person who never did anything wrong because he was God's son, was him being crucified at the hand, unjustly at the hands of sinful men, was that a good thing? From one perspective, in the human perspective, no. We would see it as grave injustice. But from a God perspective, we see that God works out all things together for good. And that he's able to take the darkest moment of human history, the Son of God being crucified, the perfect Lamb of God being sacrificed, and he's able to take the ultimate good from that to bring forgiveness, life, and resurrection to the world. The pattern that we walk is the pattern of Jesus, because we're now one with Jesus. So what Jesus exemplified for us was a life of suffering and death, but it led to resurrection, and that's the pattern that all of us have to walk through as believers. This life is not easy, And God gives us sometimes suffering as a gift to draw us closer to himself and to be like that fourth guy in the fire with us. They experienced this in Christ. And Paul is sharing this solidarity with them as he wraps it up here in verse 30. He says that you are experiencing the same conflict which you saw in me and now here to be in me. What he's saying is that conflict, opposition, suffering, it is part and parcel of the Christian life. It's something that is to be expected, and it is something that we are walking through, and yet God is in it with us together. He is there working these things. I don't know about you, but the most difficult times in my life, when I'm going through them, I don't want to be going through them. I want to get out of them as quickly as I can. I want the pain to stop. And yet what I have noticed also, though, is while what happens to me in those moments doesn't make any sense, sometimes, years later, 
I'm able to look back on those things and I can say, wow, I have seen God's hand and I can see how he's using this in my life and in my family's life. And that's what he does. Sometimes we don't, I'm not going to hold that out, and sometimes we don't get to see, even years later, what God is doing. But he is working. And faithfulness then means embracing the way of Jesus and not giving up on it. Because the way of Jesus is the way to eternal life. It is the path of life. Jesus walked this life of suffering for us. See, what Christianity says is that God got involved. Our God knows suffering. He didn't just create the world and then step back and say, okay, you guys screwed it up. Now you got to figure it out. Or I'm just going to leave you to your devices and you all are just going to destroy one another. God said, no, I love you. And I sent my son, my own son, into your world to experiencing everything that we have experienced minus sin, which Jesus never sinned. And he lived that perfect life that we owe to God because he created us, and then he died on the cross to pay for our sin so that we might be reconciled to him. And he says, if you trust in me, if you believe in me, I will give you and grant you eternal life. That's not just life that's pushed off some time in the future, but eternal life is really talking about a certain quality of life. It's being reconnected with our creator, and it's being together with our church family, where we can see the goodness of God worked out in our relationships with one another. That's the gospel. So would you believe that today? Would you trust in him today? Because it's offered to you today. And for those of us that have been walking with Jesus for a long time, the expectation is not that we're perfect. Because none of us are. If we could be perfect in our own strength, Jesus died for nothing. But one thing my mom always told me growing up, which I never really began to understand, I think, until my mid-20s, is she would look at me and she'd say, Chris, you know, growing as a Christian is really just about understanding more fully the depth of God's love for you every day. And I think that's right. God loves you so deeply that he sent his own son. And coming to understand that truth is what keeps us walking this path for years and decades to come, knowing that we are loved by God and we are walking towards the love of God. Let's pray. Lord, help us to walk worthy this year to be faithful to you. I pray, Lord, that we would be a united people here at LBC, that we would resist uh, splintering off and separating from one another like is so prominent today, that we would not give up with one another, but we would seek reconciliation and forgiveness because we have been forgiven. I pray that we would be a people of courage and boldness, knowing that you are with us, Lord, Give us a steel backbone to never bow to any other gods but Jesus. And firm trust in you that come what may, you are in control. Lord, give us perseverance in the face of suffering. Lord, we know that it will come because it came for Christ, the perfect one. But Lord, give us perseverance and endurance in those times, knowing that that when we suffer in those ways, we are sharing uh, with Christ. Lord, we want to be faithful to you. Make it so. Amen. Well, as we prepare to respond, uh, just a couple of things that we want to let you know about uh, that are coming up. Uh, this very week. This is Holy Week, as you know, and so uh, as we prepare uh, for Easter, uh, there's a couple of things that will be happening this next week. One of those things is our Good Friday service, which will take place 7 p.m. here on Friday evening. Um, Because the egg hunt outreach was canceled yesterday due to 
extreme rain and terrible weather. Uh, Lord willing, we will be able to do that again this coming Saturday on the 8th. And so again, there's just one more chance to invite some friends, neighbors, uh, co-workers, and their kids to be able to come out uh, next Saturday morning for the egg hunt. And then finally, uh, Easter Sunday, the high point of our year as we remember the resurrection of Christ and we celebrate together. We'll be gathering for our service at 10 a.m., but we will also have a uh, traditional hymn sing from 915 to 945. So if you'd like to come and participate, come a little early uh, for that time. And again, just one ask of you as church members is that knowing that uh, Easter Sunday is a Sunday when lots of family and uh, community members will come to church. Uh, we'd ask that if you are a regular attender here and this is your home, that you just park as far away from here as possible uh, and let uh, those who are coming for the first time find their way in uh, most naturally. And let's welcome uh, those who are here with the, the warmness of Christ. Um, we are going to uh, have our offering now as a response. So if those who are collecting the offering would come forward. And just as a reminder, um, this is not something that we are asking or expecting you to give anything, especially if this is your first time or you're new to this church. Uh, we give uh, gifts and offering in glad response to God's greatest gift toward us in giving his own son. Uh, and if you are a member uh, of this church family, your giving helps to advance the mission of Christ here at this church. Uh, but giving gifts and offerings is not the only way we respond. Sometimes we simply respond with the next step of faith. And so maybe this week uh, there is something that you've been challenged to believe or a challenge of obedience to Christ that you have been challenged to do. Uh, and so during this time is a time uh, for you to reflect and consider, uh, what is my next step when it comes to following Jesus? Would you join me now as I lead us in a prayer of response? Father, we thank you that you have given the greatest gift of all in your son. We thank you that in your great love for us, you have sent Jesus to be the savior of the world for all of us who would believe. Father, we thank you that we got to celebrate that this morning in these baptisms as we remember uh, for many of us what is true of us in Christ, that we have through faith been buried to our old way of life, buried in our sin, and raised through Christ's power to walk in newness of life. Father, may that be a physical and visible reminder to all of us to walk the new life in Christ to walk worthy of the calling with which we have been called, to keep in step with your spirit this week. Father, as we sing now in response to this, would you warm up our affections for Christ? Would you help us uh, this week to remain faithful to you in every way? In the name of Christ, our Savior, amen.
Prepare to be sent. We remember that following Jesus in this world is hard. We walk the way of the cross, but here's some good news and the blessing for the road. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. You're sent. Amen.